I'm about to show you three images. What do you see in this image? And what do you see in this image? In the first image, there is no triangle there. In this second image, those lines are actually parallel. One more, here's one of my favorites. How many faces do you see in this image, not counting the dog? You might want to pause the video here. Most people I ask say five or six, when there are actually nine, and I'll show you where later. Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're going to explore the holism and reductionism debate in psychology. This debate is about what is the best way to explain and understand behavior. Should we explain and understand behavior by being reductionist, by breaking human behavior down to its smallest component parts, or should we understand behavior holistically by considering human behavior as an indivisible whole? Think about cake for a minute, perhaps a classic Victoria sponge. To be reductionist would be to consider all the individual ingredients that make up the cake, like the flour, the sugar, the eggs and the butter. In other words, you could explain a cake in terms of its component parts. But when you and I eat a cake, nobody goes, oh, the flour. Ugh, that baking powder was just spot on. In other words, the cake is more than simply adding up all the ingredients. It becomes something more. You need to consider the cake holistically as a whole rather than its separate parts in order to appreciate what makes a cake a cake. So let's explore holism first and then reductionism before considering the strengths and limitations of each at the end. Holism comes from the Greek word holos, which means all or whole, and is the idea that human behaviour should be understood not as separate parts, but as an integrated whole. If you want to understand human behaviour, says the holistic view, you need to do more than simply focus on the individual parts on their own. It's more important to consider how all the parts work together. You need to look at the entire person. It's only by understanding the whole can we really understand human experience. And this brings us to Gestalt psychologists. They were a group of German researchers working in the 1920s and 30s who stated that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This meant that any attempt to break up behavior and experience is inappropriate, as these can only be understood by analyzing the person or behavior as a whole. Gestalt psychologists were particularly interested in our perception of the world. Evidence for the holistic view comes from their research into perception. They demonstrated the ways that individual parts relate to one another and can influence how we see them. For example, when you see saw this image, you saw a triangle. But your mind is processing all of these individual lines as a whole to perceive a triangle. The same with this image. These horizontal lines are all parallel. If you don't believe me, you can pause the video, grab a ruler and check it yourself. But your mind is processing all of these black and white lines together, not as separate parts. And because your mind is perceiving them holistically, the lines are influencing each other to make them look slanted. Another example is the famous Muller Lyre illusion. What do you see here? What do you notice about the two horizontal lines? Now I know at this point that you probably know what's going on and you can figure it out, but be honest, what do your eyes see? Your eyes should see that the two horizontal lines are different lengths. The top one is longer than the other. However, knowing what you now know, you won't be surprised to know that they are exactly the same length. Again, if you don't believe me, grab your ruler and measure them. So why does this happen? It's because the outer parts of the image, these lines, are influencing the way you perceive the horizontal line. You are not looking at it as separate individual lines, but as a whole. Gestalt psychologists would therefore argue that in the real world, what we see only makes sense when we consider the whole image rather than the separate parts. And for those of you waiting to see where all the nine faces were in this image, let me show you now. Importantly, your mind is perceiving faces where really there aren't any. The big face in the middle isn't actually there. There is sky under the arch in the background, the hay over here and the people, but your mind is perceiving it as a whole 
and seeing a face. The holistic view can be further seen in humanistic psychology who are strong proponents of this view. Abraham Maslow was interested in human motivation and his hierarchy of needs doesn't simply focus on one part of motivation but rather multiple factors including the environment, our relationships with others and our emotions. Likewise, when Carl Rogers was trying to help people through client-centered therapy, he saw successful therapy as bringing together all aspects of the whole person, where they lived, what their job was, what happened in their childhood, and how much stress they had in their lives. Different contributing factors interacting. Humanistic psychologists believe in the richness of human experience, and so to understand a person, they focused on all the parts of a person's life. To explain human behaviour in a reductionist way, for them, would be to dehumanise a person, to view them as less than the complete human being that they are. So that's holism. But what about reductionism? Reductionism can be defined as explaining complex behaviours by breaking them down to their smallest, most basic parts. This is based on the idea of parsimony, the idea that the simplest level of explanation is the best. There are different types of reductionism, two of which we'll explore here. Firstly, biological reductionism. This explains behaviour at the level of genes and brain chemicals. For example, it takes a complex behaviour like OCD and breaks it down to the role of specific neurotransmitters, such as having lower levels of serotonin. Secondly, environmental reductionism. This explains behaviour at the level of the environment and is typified by behaviourist explanations that suggest that all all behaviour can be explained in terms of simple stimulus response links. For example, phobias will be the result of classical conditioning, the association of a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus, and will be maintained by negative reinforcement, the avoidance of the feared stimulus which strengthens the behaviour. Another way of considering the holism and reductionism debate relates to what's called levels of explanation. As the name suggests, there are different levels at which behaviour can be explained. Reductionism can be viewed as a hierarchy moving from the lowest, most basic biological level through to a broader, middle, psychological level and then to a wider, sociological level. For example, take OCD. At the lower biological level, we could explore the level of serotonin in the brain. At the middle psychological level, we could consider the obsessive irrational thoughts they are experiencing and how that makes them feel. At the higher cultural and social level, we could consider how OCD is affecting their social relationships. Or take stress as an example. At the lower biological level, we could explore the body's stress response in terms of adrenaline and cortisol. At the middle psychological level, we could consider individual differences in terms of type A and type B personality. At the higher cultural and social level, we could consider the level of social support and friends a person has in their life. The holistic explanation would take into account all aspects of a person's behaviour. So in this debate, which one is better? Should we adopt a reductionist or a holistic explanation of behaviour? Some have argued for a more reductionist view for the following reasons. Firstly, to be reductionist is to be scientific. This is because the scientific process involves clearly defined variables. In other words, breaking complex behaviour down to a single component. This reductionist approach allows for cause and effect to be established. And you can only establish cause and effect if you have control of the variables which you only achieve through being reductionist. Furthermore, reductionist approaches also fit with the scientific method in terms of being objective. For example, with behaviorism and the Skinner box, he was able to objectively count how many times the rat pressed the lever. In contrast, holistic approaches prefer case studies, diaries, and interviews, which, whilst producing richer, more detailed information, lack objectivity and the ability to control variables to establish cause and effect. 
Therefore, if psychology adopts a reductionist view to behavior, it helps psychology gain scientific credibility. Secondly, a reductionist approach has practical applications. For example, breaking conditions like OCD down to the low biological level of neurotransmitter imbalances has led to the creation of drug treatments. SSRIs are a type of drug that specifically increase the levels of serotonin in the brain, which some researchers found to help reduce OCD symptoms. It's only through this focused reductionist approach where specific individual parts have been researched in depth that benefits such as these drug treatments are developed. However, some have argued against a reductionist view. This is because adopting a reductionist view leads to a loss of meaning. Consider OCD again. If lower biological levels are considered on their own, other reasons involved in the behavior may be overlooked. For example, very often the drug known as SSRIs are given to people with OCD. However, this may miss the real causes of a child's obsessive compulsive behavior, such as past traumas and anxious experiences. In fact, a reductionist view ignores the complex interaction of many factors which can be seen in the diathesis stream model as an explanation of OCD, which considers how biological and environmental factors interact and affect one another. Therefore, it could be argued that simply focusing on lower level reductionist explanations fails to fully consider the complexity of human behavior, as some behaviors can only really be investigated in the holistic context in which they occur. That's the end of the Issues and Debates series. For videos on any of the content mentioned in this video, you'll find it link below and for a playlist on another area of psychology you can click on the screen now. I hope you found this video and series helpful and we'll see you in the next one.